kicked off in a series of little classes that I offer um, that are going to be virtual this year, I believe. Uh, I don't know that we can really offer in person again uh, for a little while, but uh, it's a series of classes that really kind of deal with uh, helping people with weight management. And there's different topics of weight management. Um, each time I do a, a, a class, it's kind of a different topic. And uh, the, the classes are all going to be kind of a presentation at the beginning, usually about 30, 45 minutes, sometimes an hour. And then the last part, generally, I will do a little cooking segment. It's a really simple little dish that just to give you guys some idea of a healthy meal that you can make at home that's easy, cost effective and that kind of thing and, and practical. Um, this is not a cooking um this is not a cooking series per se. I'm not a chef. Um, there's not a whole, you know, it's not the, not the main focus, but it is part of it. Um, so it's really the focus is mostly on just helping you to have some practical tools that you can use, um, you know, to help you with weight loss, weight management. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and let's see if I can share my screen and uh, we will launch my presentation. And uh, there will be time for questions at the end. Um, this video is being recorded. Um, so you will be able to uh, view this, hopefully, fingers crossed, down the road. If you miss any part of this, it'll be uploaded to the Karelian Wellness YouTube channel. That is the goal. Um, so, but, but it is being recorded, so just keep that in mind, you know, um, you know, for using the audio or whatever. But I do welcome questions and answers at the end. Uh, when I start doing the cooking segment, that's usually a good time for you to pose questions. And I'm more than happy to answer questions and talk with you guys. You can either unmute your microphone at that time um, or just pose a question on the chat. Um, I have somebody helping me from Carillion named Annette Blackwell. She's been very gracious to help me tonight with this video and she can field some of your questions and kind of relay them to me or if there's any technical problems, she's kind of here to help with that as well. Okay, so I think all that's out of the way. Uh, so good evening. Uh, this, this class is going to be dealing with the Mediterranean meal pattern and aspects of weight loss. And so you may have heard a lot about Mediterranean diet. <clears throat> Notice I use the words meal pattern and not diet because diet confuses people and they think this is a special weight loss gimmick or plan. It is not specific for just weight loss. Mediterranean meal pattern is just a style of eating that we know is very, very healthy based on a lot of research that's been done over the decades. Um, but it can be utilized also in such a way to help you lose weight um, with calorie restriction and exercise. Definitely it can be part of a weight management weight loss program for sure. And that's what I try to always advocate for with my patients that I see at Carillion as a dietitian. Um, so uh, I'll give you a little brief intro about myself, a little bit about my background. Uh, for those of you who are new, um, you'll find that interesting probably. For those of you that have seen some of my videos, a lot of this will be a repeat, unfortunately, but uh, that's a pretty brief part. And then we'll move into a little bit about obesity as a problem. And, uh, and weight loss strategies, things you can do to help you to lose weight, things that I talk to my patients about. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the bulk of the presentation is really going to be about this Mediterranean style of eating meal pattern. And um, unlike previous years, this year I, I tried to put some more graphics kind of showing you the different components of what we're calling this. A lot of people don't know what Mediterranean diet is. It's a buzzword. They hear it a lot. They don't really know what it means. So I'm really trying tonight to give some examples of practical meals, some pictures, some descriptions, some menus, and just sort of go through those to give you an idea of kind of what we're talking about when we say Mediterranean. Um, and I think that'll help a lot. And then as with all of my classes, those folks that are here tonight that are watching me and, and listening, um, you will be emailed some supplementary materials on the email after the class, and there's links to some of the websites that I go to that I might reference. And there's also information about the uh, the, the uh, meal that comes at the end of this talk. Uh, it's a little Mediterranean style soup that I'm going to make, and there's information, you know, so you can go out onto the internet and, and find that. It's actually from the uh, Diabetes Association uh, website. All righty, so uh, let me see if I can advance my slide here. It seems to be uh, frozen. 
Uh, okay, now it's moving again. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is my series of classes for this year, just as an FYI. So coming up in March, uh, I'm going to deal with physical activity to support weight loss. May, we've got tracking and measuring. Um, July, we're going to talk about emotional eating. Uh, managing stress, dealing with food cues, and things of that nature, sort of the mental aspect of weight management. Um, in September, uh, we're going to look into um, kind of some of the nuts and bolts as far as understanding how to measure portions, looking at food labels, kind of the, some of those little aspects of things, maybe using food scales, things that maybe you're not doing now, but that might help you or, or maybe things that you're confused about, about food labels, and we can go over that. Um, October will be my last talk of this year. Uh, the plan for that is going to kind of deal with how to navigate the holidays, um, which we sort of just got through. <laughs> um, so as we all know, that's typically kind of a, uh, a challenging period. So that's the plan. Uh, it's a total of, I guess, about six classes about every other month. Um, that's kind of where it's at right now. Now, I may offer additional classes to be determined depending upon my schedule. Um, there's another dietitian, Angela, who works at community um, health and outreach. And um, sometimes we team up with things. So just uh, you know, stay tuned, look at the Karelian calendar, um, and just kind of monitor that. Usually everything that we present from Karelian is going to be on that calendar. So. All righty, so real quick, my bio. Um, so I am an individual who has struggled with weight since I was at least a teenager. Um, I am now 49, no longer a teenager. <laughs> um, and uh, so I was a member of Weight Watchers more than once. I have experienced yo-yo dieting. Um, I have never done what I would call fad dieting. However, I always tried to stay with either Weight Watchers or just um, kind of monitoring my own uh, intake and, and things of that nature, but not really fads. This is a little snippet from a Weight Watchers uh, logbook back in uh, 1997, and that was one of the lower weights that I was able to achieve. I'm a six foot four and a half inch man. 220 is pretty decent for me, generally speaking, and I was really thrilled with that. Unfortunately, um, you know, obesity is is considered a disease, um, and it you know it is something that is sort of you manage it, but you don't cure it. Um, so I did have some ups and downs um, and significant ups and downs. We're talking 60, 70 pound gains and then another 60, 70 pound loss. And kind of, I did that a couple of times. Um, this last big loss that thank goodness I've been able to keep it off um, was 2011 to 2012. That was a really, really big weight loss, 115 pounds. And I had these pants that you could put both my legs into one of the leg holes after I lost the weight and that kind of thing. So that's, you know, kind of a cool visual. I've kept those pants around. I'll pull them out every so often. Um, the secret, there was no secret other than just really hard work. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I wish there was a secret that I could share and say, just, you know, eat more guacamole and you'll lose all this weight um, or eat more bananas or something. But unfortunately, what it comes down to is um, very, very, um, very uh, strict sort of adherence to trying to, you know, be knowledgeable about what I was eating, um, changing my lifestyle, exercising more, bringing in more healthy foods, um, a lot of things like that, a lot of lifestyle changes, a lot of tracking and measuring, a lot of a lot of effort really to do that. Um, um, and I was very, very thrilled that I was able to accomplish that. And uh, so uh, I actually became a runner in the course of all this weight loss. Um, which was really amazing to me because I was somebody who hated exercise when I was in school, when I was, you know, K through 12 or whatever. I, I could barely run, had severe asthma, and, uh, you know, I, I could barely do 100 yards and basically be bent over and couldn't breathe. So um, for me to become a runner was kind of shocking to my family, to myself. <laughs> I was like, I, I don't even know why I'm doing this. I mean, it didn't seem like something that was even possible. But eventually I was able to do a marathon and uh, – I even got a little thing in the paper. Uh, there's a group I used to run with in Stanton, and one of the guys was actually a newspaper editor, and he wrote up about some of us that were out there exercising. So that was pretty cool. Um, I'm still a runner to this day. However, I'm not doing marathons. Uh, I've had some back issues and some weird things, just maybe just getting older, you know, uh, some of that kind of stuff. But I'm, but I still run. I just don't do as much distance, and I do a lot of biking as well. Um, 
I, I'm somebody that started out in a different field. I was actually in electrical engineering and I was sort of kind of early in that career and I was kind of shopping for a different career and I had this big health transformation in 2011. I thought, you know, this is something I'm really passionate about. I want to help people to lose weight. Um, and so I changed careers, became a dietitian because I wanted to have, you know, a, a good knowledge base and, you know, some, some, uh, you know, some, some knowledge behind it, not just somebody who's, you know, out there, you know, peddling something. I wanted to actually, you know, be kind of more clinically based. So I got the, uh, I got the RD and uh, took the exam, did an internship at Lenore Ryan University, and then I began work, began work at Carilion Clinic in 2018. And there I am counseling one of my uh, many patients there. So uh, what is obesity? Um, so it's, it was declared a disease state back in 2013 by American Medical Association, along with a bunch of other societies. There's a long list of societies. This was not something that you know one or two doctors stated this was a consensus opinion that was sort of issued with by many many professionals in the field um back then and it's still you know clinically speaking considered to be a disease state um generally it's defined with the body mass index body mass index is certainly not a perfect indice for this and there's certainly definitely some dietitians out there that are very uh, you know against using bmi to measure things i'm sort of a person that you know, I'll just let them know this is sort of the clinical standard, but people do vary. And, uh, you know, you have to keep that in mind with all these things. But generally, that's kind of the, the threshold. And that's a ratio of your height to your weight is what defines that BMI number. And um, it's also more generally described as just a, you know, increased weight at a level to be caused reduce, cause reduced health and longevity. Um, so again, it's a disease state that can be managed. There really is not a cure. Um, I think that's kind of an important point. Um, some people sort of, you know, through incredible efforts and changes to their lifestyle, they are able to keep the weight off. And but uh, so they're managing it. But but by doing that, they're not necessarily really curing it. Um, it you know, there's this tendency your body really wants to kind of pull you back up to where you were. And um, those are real issues that are very challenging to ever get rid of. It's sort of a, a biochemical process. Um, you know, there is uh, one of the most successful ways to, to kind of, you know, sort of address it is bariatric surgery, but that is a very extreme approach, of course, but that has had very good success. There are some medications now that are extremely successful um, that might even rival the success rate of bariatric surgery, but none of those are cures. And there's certainly a lot of patients that I see that come in that have had bariatric surgery and they've gained it all back, which is, you know, kind of tragic. Um, um, so th that's just something to keep in mind, but, but there's, there is, you know, there is hope there. It's not like it's hopeless. We're not all destined to gain it all back. I have not gained it all back. Um, there's definitely things you can do to prevent that, um, from happening. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this slide too much, but it's just sort of going over the disease state sort of situation. This is a slide by a Dr. Robert Kushner, who is sort of well known in the field of, of weight management. Um, and uh, he had a, some presentations where he talks about this lipotoxicity where this additional fat cells, you know, the adipose tissue fat cells, as you kind of build up more and more of those fat cells, they're kind of connected through all these various signaling proteins to disease states. So, you know, we have the inflammation, increased inflammation, arthritis, asthma, cancer, heart disease, hypertension, uh, diabetes. I mean, all these things are kind of linked to this process of having the excess adipose tissue and some signaling going on. Um, so, um, you know, it is a disease. It's something that, um, yes, if you exercise more, you can help with some of these risk factors. But ideally, um, you want to try to not be in that obese state. You want to try to reduce the fat cell content so you're kind of no longer in this kind of higher risk state. So um, again, motivations for weight loss, a lot of them are on that slide, but um, here's a few other things. A lot of folks have trouble sleeping with uh, the higher level of fat and obesity. Um, sleep apnea is real common. That's where your, your breathing gets cut off in the middle of the night. Um, and you know, sometimes they have to use sleep, CPAP machines to help them breathe better. Of course, you know, high blood pressure, diabetes, various heart problems, just generalized increased inflammation, which can also worsen 
uh, folks that have, you know, maybe knee and hip pain and arthritis pains. Um, and there it is, arthritis, cancers. Uh, cancers are associated with uh, obesity. Um, and really just anywhere in the range of 3 to 10%, as little as 3% of initial weight loss, you can see some benefits in these things. You can see your pressure getting a little better, or maybe your A1C with your diabetes gets a little better. Um, so it, it's, it's surprisingly, uh, I won't say easy, but it, it's surprising how little you can lose and actually start to see benefits to your health. So, you know, even if you're not down to where you were maybe in high school or something, um, which is really probably not a, a practical goal for most people anyway, but, you know, you just have to remind yourself of that. Like, hey, I've lost, you know, whatever it is, 5%, 7%, maybe it's 20 pounds, 30 pounds. I mean, don't ever discount that because you've really done a, a tremendous service for yourself, um, you know, just for lo your longevity and, and just quality of life. Um, so the scope of the problem, it's rising. Um, we're approaching 50%. I suspect when the new numbers come out with the pandemic, we're going to be over 50% for adults. So that dark line is for the adult, uh, for the obesity, and then the, the green line is for severe. So that's just a little higher level of obesity, 40 or above uh, body mass index. So that's that trend. And then uh, as far as the U.S. map, uh, this was just updated 2020. Um, more or less, it's been the same pattern since I've been doing these talks since, since 2018. It's always kind of the deep south and, uh, you know, kind of that that band there. <laughs> you can see it's dark red, and that's, that's where kind of a lot of the, the, the worst obesity rates are. And then you go to the west, and it gets a little better, uh, Hawaii and those kind of states. And there's a little chunk of the northeast, a little bit better. Um, anyhow, um, as I said earlier, all is not lost. Uh, no pun intended with loss. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's not all negative or sad or hopeless. Um, there are people that have lost very significant amounts of weight, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent. And kept it off for many years, and they they actually you know there's a, a registry called the National Weight Control Registry. Um, this is scientifically studied. This group of individuals is followed over you know year after year to kind of see what are they doing, what are their habits, how are they managing to do this when it seems like everything you see on TV and everything you hear is just doom and gloom. Everyone's gaining it back. Well, um, and you know it's a group of 10,000 people that they they have. Um, a lot of the key stats is, um, you know, some of the, the key takeaways is that, you know, they, they don't skip breakfast. They do not watch a lot of TV. One of the biggest things I always find from this data set is that they exercise often. I mean, as much as an hour a day. Now, most of that exercise is walking. These are not all, you know, marathon runners by any means. These are just average, ordinary people, you know, like all of us that are just trying to, you know, get in some activity. Um, and so, uh, you know, with some modest kind of daily activity and, uh, you know, kind of minimizing some of these other things like the television, not not doing anything crazy. I mean, most of them, you know, they they went they lost weight via a low fat diet generally or just kind of a balanced diet approach. They're not really doing fad diets, um, you know, and, and most of them track. Most of them still kind of weigh themselves, as you see, see there once a week. So they're still some of this vigilance that they still have to have. Um, one of the things that my patients sometimes are sad about or upset about is they don't want to hear that message. They want to see an approach where they can lose weight, keep it off forever, and not have to think about it. You know, it's just automatic. They just, you eat healthy, you're good, you never gain it back. Now, there are, there, there are a minority of people that can seem to kind of do that to a degree, uh, but that is not the norm, unfortunately. Um, it seems like most people you know, um, that have been obese, uh, to keep it off, they have to have a little bit of vigilance still. That doesn't mean maybe they're, they're logging every single day on an app, but they, they may have to occasionally check in with that. They usually have to kind of keep track of their weight and stuff like that. So, so that's kind of how it breaks down. Um, and, uh, so yeah, and behaviors of maintenance is very similar to, to what they did, uh, for the weight loss. So, um, so there's different strategies for weight loss. Again, today we're going to talk about the Mediterranean pattern, um, tracking and weighing, um, exercise and support. Those are kind of 
in a nutshell, sort of the four kind of key aspects of a, a typical weight management program as far as, you know, um, you know, the mental aspect of it is kind of through that support piece, um, kind of mindfulness, mindful eating, and that kind of thing falls into that sort of category, I would say. Um, tracking and weighing is is sort of just part of the process of, you know, kind of keeping tabs on things so that you can make sure that you have continued success. Exercise, very important. And, you know, this today's talk is really about establishing that baseline healthy style of eating. You know, what is that? And Mediterranean is really, again, I said at the outset, it's not just for weight loss. It's something that you should be doing if you're maintaining your weight or losing weight or whatever. It's just what you should try, what we should all try to achieve, um, I think, you know, for just a healthy baseline way of eating. Um, and it's very close to what this MyPlate, MyPlate is a USDA sort of guidelines for a healthy diet. It used to be kind of the food pyramid. Um, eventually it sort of morphed into this, but this is, uh, you know, basically kind of the same thing. You have your different food groups. And one of the key takeaways with this and with Mediterranean is a heavy reliance on the fruits and vegetables, the produce. Um, you know, and vegetables don't mean French fries. I'll just say that right off the top. <laughs> French fries are not, you know, technically, yeah, you can think of it as a vegetable, but for all intents and purposes, when we're talking about vegetables as dietitians to try to help you, we're mostly talking about the non-starchy vegetables, the, the leafy greens, the carrots, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the, you know, asparagus. These are the kind of things you really want to pile high on your plates. Uh, really, every meal you should have at least a cup or two serving of these types of foods. They're extraordinarily healthy. Um, the fiber from them can help change your gut flora to help support you to keep your weight off, help you feel more satisfied with meals. There's a million reasons why you want to do that. Um, most of us do not do that. Um, the fruits and the vegetables and the fruits as well. Sometimes they get a bad rap for sugar in them or whatever, but really, um, you know, compared to most of the foods that we're eating in our diet and you know, unless you're, you know, even with diabetics, they can still have a you know piece of fruit with their meals or at least half a banana. I mean, fruits are extremely healthy as well, just as vegetables are. You really want to have both of those in your diet. Um, these other groups, protein, grains, dairy, want to have those as well. And we're going to dive into the Mediterranean spin on this, but this is essentially very close to Mediterranean, really. I mean, um, the two, these two plans are very similar, and that's why I mentioned this. Um, and uh, that goes into kind of the different portions that you should be looking at for, for the fruits, the vegetables, the grains, for about a 2,000 calorie diet. So, and that's kind of your typical sort of, you know, calorie level of diet um, that you'll see on food labels. Everything's based on 2,000 calories. Um, you don't have to worry about this grid. There's no exam at the end of the talk or anything. I just threw this in there just to, to show you, because this is for the Mediterranean diet. This is also from the USDA, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. So this is their take on what is a healthy Mediterranean style pattern in terms of food groups. If you break it down, it's very, very similar to that graphic I just showed you. I mean, you've got two to three servings of vegetables uh, cups every day at least two servings of fruits every day, two to three. Where it differs really from, and we'll get into this more in the next 30 minutes here as I talk about it more, but where it differs from kind of the standard sort of my plate food pyramid thing is when you look at the types of protein. So seafood, ounces per week is 15 ounces per week uh, for the Mediterranean plan. That is definitely not quite the same as USDA pattern. Um, oils, there's uh, an emphasis on olive oil, and there's also an emphasis on nuts and seeds with this plan. So you'll see, you know, at least five kind of servings of nuts and seeds a week. Uh, the 15 ounces, I mean, if you think of this, a, a, a rule of thumb or a rule of, you know, rule to kind of think about portions is a deck of cards, like playing cards, that's about three ounces. So it's kind of like a small fish fillet. So you're looking at like five of those small fish fillets a week, you know, um, whether it be tuna or salmon, whatever kind of fish or seafood. Um, so that's that's pretty significantly different. Um, and, you know, there's there's maybe different reasons why that's making the diet healthier. Um, it could be, you know, one of the main thoughts about it is omega-3 fatty acids. And we'll, we'll talk about that here in a bit. 
Um, but uh, anyway, I mean, there's there's a lot of emphasis on the fruits and vegetables, whole grains, the seafood, the nuts and seeds, the olive oil. Um, so this is sort of the Mediterranean diet pyramid that uh, I've seen this pop up a lot. When you do any searches on it, you see this old ways diagram and it kind of shows you the, the old style sort of food pyramid. And you can see fish and seafood are pretty huge, but fruits and vegetables and whole grains take up the whole bottom of the pyramid. I mean, that's really what you're eating for the most part. You, know, you can see a, a jug of olive oil in there. <laughs> Um, citrus fruits, tomatoes, uh, whole grain breads, potatoes, peas, beans, nuts, that's all in there. Um, the, the poultry, the eggs, cheese, they're in there, but not as much. Um, kind of the predominant proteins are kind of more the fish and the seafood with a little bit of, of poultry as well. Uh, the red meats are not even really on there. Um, you do find red meat sometimes in Mediterranean plans, you know, as far as pork and, and stuff, but it's very minimal. Um, they do not eat a lot of beef or pork. Um, so you will see at the very, very tippy top, it says meats and sweets. So it is in there. One of the controversial aspects might be is the wine. Um, wine is listed, <clears throat> but it's very moderately consumed, you know, for men, no more than really, a, you know, two glasses a day, um, if that. Um, research really shows that less is better when it comes to alcohol. So I don't really talk about the wine aspect. I'd much rather see you guys eating grapes than drinking the wine. That's that's sort of my take on that. I mean, uh, alcohol consumption seems to be sort of a dose response thing with bad health outcomes. The more you drink, the, the worse it gets. Um, there's been some controversy about that over the years, but that seems to be for now where that is headed is, is we just don't think it's it's really that helpful to have it that much. Um, if you want some with your meal once in a while, that's okay, but it really needs to be um, kept to a low level. So um, so there's some definitions out there. What I will say at the top is you will find not really a single standard for what this is. So that makes it a little confusing. Um, I did show you the USDA standard. That was that little chart. Um, you can go online and find that. It's part of the, the dietary guidelines for Americans. So there are some out there, but they vary. They're, they're, not, they're not all agreeing with each other perfectly. Um, but uh, according to the American Health Association, the foundation of this, um, program it's it's based on um, 16 countries that border the mediterranean sea and again fruits vegetables potatoes beans nuts and seeds olive oil uh, predominant very little red meat again all the things we just said fish poultry and dairy moderate um, very few eggs there are eggs in it but it's not not an egg diet <laughs> um, kind of limited wine and then fat sometimes you'll hear it hear people say that you know, Mediterranean diet is not really a low fat diet. Um, I, you know, there's one dietitian that I'm going to reference here in a, in a few minutes that actually calls it a high fat diet. Um, my take on it is it's, it's middle of the road. I mean, I don't know. I'd say it's low, but I also wouldn't say it's high. Um, generally, you know, people that are doing things like keto where they cut out their carbs, that's generally a pretty high fat uh, way to go. Um, this program, I mean, you know, sure, if you really go crazy with the olive oil, you can make it a higher fat diet, you know, if you really eat a lot of the nuts and seeds. Um, for weight management and weight loss, um, practically speaking, if you really use a lot of fat, it can sometimes make it a little harder to kind of track and just stay on target with your calories um, is kind of a practical fallout from that. Um, but, uh, you know, the fats in this program are healthy, so they're not going to cause you, you know, to have any sort of cardiac issues. You know, olive oil, the nuts and seeds, it's, it's about as healthy as you can get. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, uh, I, I think it's somewhere in the middle of the road from what I've noticed with, with the fat. And, um, again, very close to USDA's sort of generic pattern. Um, why do we talk about it? Why is it in the news? Uh, well, research has always been showing that it's got much better health results from any other pattern that we know about. Um, you know, prevention of heart disease, increased lifespan, promotes healthy aging. Um, there was a landmark paper that came out um, a few years ago that did a randomized controlled trial with a very large group of uh, people in Spain. So randomized controlled trials, those are kind of the, uh, 
you know, the gold standard for research. So, so when you do randomized controlled trials, generally you can have more faith that that's, that's a real result. You know, it's, it, it's actually getting to causation, not just correlation, you know, um, you know, it's, it's not like somebody has less heart disease because the phase of the moon was a quarter moon. Um, that would be, that would be a correlation. <laughs> um, causation means that, Hey, um, with this carefully designed trial study, we know that we can actually link these eating habits to, you know, things like less heart disease and less diabetes. So, um, so that was pretty important. It was 2013 New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so um, they actually compared the Mediterranean diet to a standard low fat diet. Standard low fat diet is more or less the USDA pattern, which I stated earlier, which is itself is also a healthy diet. Um, so I don't want to give the impression that you know low fat diet's not healthy. It actually is healthy, but um, Mediterranean actually still was better, and we had better declines in heart disease risk, um, you know, 30 percent. So um, it's been ranked as a number one diet by U.S. News and World Report. Sort of an interesting side note on that. Um, because of my classes that I do, somehow a reporter from U.S. News and World Report saw I was doing a class for Karelian on Mediterranean diet last year, and they contacted me and interviewed me. So if you Google uh, U.S. News World Report, put my name in there, um, <laughs> you'll see a little brief interview I did about it um, with my patients. That was kind of fun. But um, anyway, every year in January, they issue this report where they um, go through all the various diets uh, for weight loss or just for health, uh, for various things, and they rank them. And Mediterranean diet's number one for best diabetes diet, number one heart healthy diet, number one easiest to follow diet, <clears throat> excuse me, number one plant-based diet, number one best diets for healthy eating. So it's just number one all over the place. Um, so so yeah, I mean, and there's reasons behind that. There's, you know, again, all the research, the teams of medical experts they pull in, that's sort of the consensus. Um, Mediterranean type diets containing fiber, fruits and vegetables reduce the risk of weight gain, overweight and obesity. Um, and again, they are associated with a 17% cancer risk reduction per 90 grams of whole grains per day. Um, so 90 grams of whole grains, you're looking at maybe, you know, kind of like six servings of bread, I believe, if my numbers are right. Um, so, uh, and that's from uh, Institute of uh, Cancer Research. They do a, a continuing, a continuous update project report every so many years, and um, they evaluate all these things as well and for, for cancer purposes. And so cancer risk reduction is a big part of Mediterranean um, style of eating for sure. So this is the part where I want to get into kind of talking about, you know, just giving you some examples of what goes into this. What are we talking about? Um, somehow when I've done these talks before, I, you know, I've given some of that information I just gave, but it seems very dry to me. And I look back on it, it seems kind of academic, kind of like a scholarly talk. <laughs> and I don't know how much of that gets transmitted to my audience. So I wanted to try a slightly different approach and just break it down like these different elements um, of what goes into this. So <clears throat> one of the first, you know, kind of obvious elements is vegetables. And, you know, of what are, why are vegetables so important? Um, so um, there's something called the phenolic compounds, which is kind of a fancy way of saying antioxidants. There's these chemicals that are inherent in plants, uh, whether it be fruits or vegetables, <clears throat> that have a lot of properties that we're still learning about, honestly. And sometimes they can work in conjunction with one another um, in ways that may reduce cancer risks or risk of diabetes in ways that maybe we don't totally understand yet. But we see these studies kind of like the Predimed that I mentioned earlier that, you know, we know if we eat all these things that it's helping people. So. Um, as time goes on, I'm sure we will learn more about some of the, you know, some of the mixtures of compounds that are critical for some of these effects. But we do know, loosely speaking, that these phenolic compounds, the antioxidants, um, you know, they give a lot of these vegetables their brilliant colors. You know, the, the yellows, the oranges that you see there, the purple with the, the eggplant. I mean, these are things that are very, very healthy for us to have in our diet. Um, Fiber, again, is a big constituent of vegetables. 
And that again is something that can help us when we're trying to lose weight because of the, the fiber fills us up. Um, it actually causes what they call stretch receptors in our stomach to kind of fire off when you have a lot of material in your stomach, you have a lot of volume in your stomach. It'll send those, it'll make those receptors send a signal to your brain that you're full. And so, of course, you know, if you're trying to lose weight, you want to you want to feel full. <laughs> As we all know, you don't want to go around feeling hungry all the time. So, so that's a big important piece of it. Um, and fiber also helps your gut health, it helps reduce risks of colorectal cancer, um, helps to promote healthier bacteria in your gut, which again can help you with uh, hunger and satiety, um, weight management. So mi million reasons why fiber is important. And again, you know, some of the things we learn probably in school or just we hear on TV commercials or wherever we hear these things. Um, there's these various minerals and vitamins that are very, you know, vegetables are very rich in these. You know, potassium, you know, something we think of maybe for our heart health, um, for blood pressure, um, vitamin A for our eyes, vitamin C maybe for uh, immune system function. Um, we have vitamin K for blood clotting. Uh, maybe vitamin E helps with some of the skin. Um, B vitamins have a whole array of different B vitamins that do various different things in our immune system or metabolism and just a lot of different functions. Um, there's copper, there's magnesium, there's iron, there's choline. Um, each of these I could do a talk on just going over all the different aspects of vitamins, but that's not the nature of my talk tonight. So I'm not going to go into all that, but suffice it to say there's an alphabet soup of important constituents to vegetables that we really need to have in our diet and you know yeah we're in an age where we can uh, take multivitamins um, but again it's kind of it's kind of a thing where you know it's not always clear that taking the refined multivitamin you know the, the refined vitamin is giving us the same benefits as getting it from a food source sometimes um, so there's reasons why it's still best to try to get them from food um, sometimes we can't avoid it. I mean, obviously there's situations we have deficiencies. We have to take that multivitamin. I don't, I don't want to discourage anyone from doing that. If your doctor prescribed it, definitely you need to do that. Um, but uh, it's always, always, always good to try to get it through food as much as possible. Um, again, uh, just like we said with this research, lower risks of mortality, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, cancer, obesity. Um, so now we move into another component. We beat that one to death. Now we're into legumes. <laughs> so legumes, what are legumes? We're thinking of like beans primarily, things like peas, beans. Um, so what are, the, so, you know, here's a few examples with the Mediterranean pattern. We have chickpeas, lentils, and then just beans. Um, they bring a lot of protein. And if you're vegetarian, you know, this is kind of predominantly where you're going to get a lot of your protein from. If, you know, if you're vegan, certainly it is. If you're vegetarian, um, you may get some, uh, you know, protein through dairy and through eggs for sure. But these are very, these are power packed foods that are rich in fiber, protein, vitamins, antioxidants. Um, they're pretty amazing kind of superfoods. Um, they are associated with a lower mortality risk, lower heart disease risk. Uh, benefit, beneficial effects on cholesterol, blood pressure, and blood sugars. Um, so you really can't go wrong with these as long as you're not dressing them up with a lot of butter or, you know, things of that nature. Um, you know, they, they're hard to beat. Um, in terms of fruits, so here's a little colorful picture of fruits. What do they bring to the table? Well, in terms of the Mediterranean pattern, some common fruits in that particular pattern are citrus fruits. So think of things like your oranges, your, you know, your limes and lemons, grapefruits, those kind of things. Berries, figs, grapes, of course, we always associate that with the Mediterranean and figs. Apricots, peaches, nectarines, cantaloupe. Um, so again, a lot of these things kind of seem like broken record. It's a lot of the same things. I mean, lower risks of all causes of death. Uh, should be heart disease, not heart disease. Uh, stroke, type 2 diabetes, blood pressure, obesity. Um, again, great sources of nutrients. So we have vitamin C, fiber, potassium, many, many different an antioxidants. Um, another major component of Mediterranean are nuts. So we all know about, you know, peanuts, cashews, you know, here some of the common ones are, you know, the peanuts, pistachios, uh, almonds, 
hazelnuts, walnuts, those are some of the predominant that you'd find in the Mediterranean plan specifically. Um, they are rich sources of mono and polyunsaturated fats. So those are the good, so-called good fats. Um, we know those are good for your heart. They're not going to be leading to heart disease. Um, many antioxidants, again, uh, vitamins E, B vitamins, fiber, once again, potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, copper, selenium. Um, so uh, consumption of these are, again, just like a lot of the other foods, we have all these great outcomes with respect to all causes, mortality, heart disease, blood pressure, obesity. Whole grains, um, they have gotten a real beating here uh, in the last five years or so. I feel like grains have anyway, um, because of some of the low carb um, you know, situation we got going on in our society right now. But whole grains, um, the ones that are common to Mediterranean diet are rice, oatmeal, um, you know, some to some degree popcorn, whole wheat breads, and whole grain cereals and whole grain pasta. So you always want to kind of preface with whole grain. We are not talking about Cheetos. Uh, <laughs> You know, we're not talking about uh, Wonder Bread that's white and fluffy. Um, you know, we're really not even talking about um, enriched wheat pasta. We're talking about whole grain pasta or maybe vegetable pastas. Um, we're talking about rich whole wheat breads. We're talking about whole grain cereals, um, brown rice, you know, maybe old fashioned oats or a steel cut. These are whole grains and these are extremely healthy for us. Um, they are rich in all these B vitamins, iron, zinc, manganese, copper, phosphorus, selenium. Um, fiber, of course, is part of the picture there as well. And these are associated with lower risks of colorectal cancer, which is one thing that's a little, you know, a little specific to them perhaps versus some of the others. Um, but also again, you know, lower mortality risks, lower heart disease, heart failure risks. Um, reductions in high blood pressure. But again, I have to emphasize, you know, when we say whole grains, we're saying whole grains. And um, sometimes carbs and whole grains are sort of just swapped back and forth in our, in the way we talk about food and our culture. And carbs might mean crackers and Cheetos and uh, corn chips at the Mexican restaurant and stuff like that. And that's really not what whole grains are. Um, so you have to kind of make that distinction. It's kind of like with sugar too. Sugar is a carb, of course, carbohydrate, but um, generally we do not have a lot of sugar, added sugars in the Mediterranean plan, nor in the uh, USDA plan. We don't recommend that. So um, just want to make those distinctions um, so that we don't sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater when we're looking at carbohydrates being somehow kind of a bad actor. Um, really the added sugars are sort of the bad actors and some of these really highly processed uh, snack foods is is what you want to sort of steer clear of. And that's, you know, that's definitely not what this is about here when we talk about whole grains. So um, another key aspect, again, is fish and seafood. So um, I mentioned this kind of earlier on, and it's very predominant. Um, salmon is what's pictured here. Uh, I, I'm a big lover of salmon myself. Uh, I try to have some regularly. Um, sardines, mackerel, bass, tuna, oyster, squid, shrimp, all these things are common in the Mediterranean um, region and they'll eat, you know, all these different types of uh, fish and seafood there. So um, they are known again as a rich source of omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA. Those are the, the chemical names of these two uh, types of fats. Um, so it's kind of a chemistry thing. It's just omega-3 is a type of a, uh, unsaturated fat that's kind of special because it seems to be uh, associated with reduced risk of heart disease and kind of reduced inflammation. Um, so, uh, you, you know, salmon and fish are, are generally a pretty rich source. Uh, you can also get it through things like walnuts or flaxseed, but uh, fish is, is a pretty strong source. And, uh, you know, the way these fatty acids work out, you sort of get a different combination of them than you would in, in the plant sources. 
Um, and, and these studies are kind of, you know, the beneficial health aspects are studying people eating the actual fish and seafood sources. So, um, you know, if you can, if you like fish, if you like seafood, I encourage you to try to, you know, bring those into the diet. If you're vegetarian, of course, you're not going to eat the fish. Um, but um, again, you know, then I would defer to the other sources of omega-3, such as, you know, flax seeds, walnuts, um, and some cereals as well. There's different ways you can get omega-3s for sure. Um, but uh, again, these are associated with lower risk of mortality, again, the heart disease and colorectal cancer, heart failure. So uh, extra virgin olive oil is, I think, the last major component of this that I wanted to, to talk about. Um, it's a key component, really, of this pattern. And maybe is something that a lot of us don't necessarily use a lot. I think it's been more in the popular consciousness, at least, you know, as a 49 year old uh, living in the US, uh, I feel like I didn't hear a lot about olive oil until maybe late 90s or somewhere in there, early 2000s, I don't know. But it seems like it's definitely become more uh, known as a healthy oil that maybe we should incorporate. Um, and it is a rich source of mono, monounsaturated fatty acids and antioxidants. Um, and again, you know, there's a lot of various plant chemicals in these foods that may be having beneficial effects, um, you know, beyond just the fact that it's a monounsaturated fatty acid. So um, we know that olive oil is associated with these healthier um, outcomes. Um, so, you know, I just encourage patients you know, if you're going to use oil, which, you know, again, I, I don't encourage you to go out and like try to deep fry stuff in olive oil. <laughs> um, actually, it wouldn't work too well anyway, because uh, olive oil has a low smoke point. So if you try to really use high temperature uh, frying with it, it'll burn. And actually, it kind of becomes not very healthy if you're, you know, having burned oil. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the message shouldn't be let's go out and drink olive oil or something. Um, but it's something that if you're going to, let's say, fry an egg or you're going to do a stir fry, you know, spritz some olive oil on it or maybe use some oil and vinegar dressing on your salad, you know, that kind of thing. Or maybe just have some olives with your meal. Um, certainly you can get olive oil from the actual olive. Um, it's something, it's a food, it's a component that we should probably think more about and, and think about, you know, having it in our cupboard and, and maybe using it a little bit more. Um, so <clears throat> it is associated with a, a fairly dramatic decrease in risk of heart disease and improvements in some inflammatory markers, according to some research. So um, I think that is something that, um, you know, and I, I do try to talk about it with my patients, but certainly, you know, it's, it's a talking point that needs to be out there, I would say. Um, so I'm going to kind of switch gears now and just sort of talk about um, some menus, and and we're not going to spend a lot of time in any, any of these view these slides here. But uh, I wanted to at least kind of give you some visuals, um, give you some examples of meals, so that you can sort of again form that mental picture. What is Mediterranean? What is Mediterranean? What is he talking about? <laughs> so you know, here's some breakfast. You might have some yogurt, berries. Um, you know, maybe maybe even something. You know outside the box a little bit, feta cheese with some olive oil tomatoes. Uh, have an orange with the breakfast, so you have the fruit as well. Um, you have hummus, you have lots of salads, carrots, um, you know, olives, hummus again, cucumber slices. I mean, you can basically see each of these meals. We've got, as we've got fruits and vegetables. We've got aspects of the Mediterranean diet. We've got olive oil, you know, presented very commonly here. Um, we have seafood with the grilled fish showing up. We've got tuna. Um, so this is a really good, I actually had a student help me come up with this. Um, this is a really good sort of you know, way to convey what, what we mean. Um, and, you know, in terms of practicalness, because I'm all about practicality with everything I do, I, I don't expect anyone, you know, watching this tonight or any of my patients to immediately go home, clear out their cabinets and just make everything strict Mediterranean. You know, it's all pitas and and grilled fish, you know, or whatever. I mean, but it's one of those things where 
if you can work in some meals that are kind of more along these lines, I think you'll do yourself a lot of favors. So um, this is another view uh, of this as far as breaking it down, you know, different days of the week. I know the print's a little small. I apologize for that, but um, it's just kind of showing you again, you got fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, beans, seafood, oils. Um, again, just kind of beating on the same drum. I mean, that's that's kind of what it's about and trying to incorporate those foods in your meals. This is yet another view from the uh, uh, Veterans Administration handout. They have a little kind of a my plate um, view of it. And basically it's same as USDA, but I mean, you've got the non-starchy vegetables filling up half your plate. Um, you've got fruits, you've got the olive oil once again, you've got the poultry and the beans. A little bit in there and the fish. Um, now this was kind of an interesting little side piece thing. Um, one of the students that, I, that was working with me um, found this uh, dietitian who actually uh, moved to the island of Crete um, and he spent many years there studying um, how they ate to try to it was kind of a personal journey for him, I guess. Uh, this guy named Bill Bradley, um, he had sort of struggled with weight and it was a personal journey to try to figure out, you know, if I eat this healthy diet, you know, first of all, what is it? You know, he's trying to identify what it is. So he uh, met with um, chefs there that um, cooked in a traditional manner and he ate that diet. And for many years, he learned how to cook it. He wrote this you know, book about it. And uh, he claims that he actually was able to lose weight um, with, you know, doing nothing more than just eating this sort of pattern. Um, what I would caution <laughs> is that's not really the message of my talk tonight. That may not be everyone's outcome from that. Um, I still advocate the use of tools to kind of measure your intake and, you know, make sure you're, you're exercising plenty and, um, you know, there's still a lot of aspects, even with the most healthy diet on the planet, you can still overeat. Um, so um, what works for some people may not work for others. This did work for him and hats off. I mean, that's great. Um, and he's got a website he, and it's very interesting. There's a picture of Island of Crete there. Um, <clears throat> and he has a, a lot of recipes that he shares. You can actually look up. He's got some recipes that he shares with you and I'm sure there's many more if you buy his book or whatever, and I'm not trying to not trying to sell his book. Um, I haven't even looked at it myself, but I've seen these these excerpts. And the basic thing I just wanted to take from this for you guys is just to kind of again see some examples um, of some different meals, what they look like on a plate. Um, you know, here's one egg noodles with walnuts and basil. Um, he's got a soup uh, here that's kind of similar to something I'm going to make tonight. Uh, at the end of my talk here in a few minutes. Uh, black eyed beans with some herbs in it or herbs. I guess if you're from Britain, you say herbs. I don't know. My wife likes to say herbs sometimes just to to kind of be funny, I guess. But <laughs> some people say it different ways. Um, this is a salmon dish uh, with spinach, lemon. So we've got, you know, kind of the citrus in there. We've got the seafood, um, we've got, you know, spinach and healthy vegetable. Um, so very pretty looking dishes. And that's one thing you'll notice. I mean, these are all very colorful dishes. They're very visually appealing. Those colors, a lot of them are coming from antioxidants, which again have you know, properties we think are helpful, you know, fighting cancer, preventing cancers. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, in a way it's sort of poetic to have, you know, food that's beautiful, that's actually good for you at the same time, you know. I always think that's kind of amazing and, you know, um, I do my best to try to eat this way uh, as, as much as I can, as often as I can, um, rather than, you know, as we know, the golden arches and some of the other options do not look this pretty <laughs> and they're not as good for you. So um, this is uh, um, another dish here. Um, looks like some potatoes and some vegetables, some olive oil in the mix. And... Uh, you know, there's another one here with a little snippet showing you kind of how he made. Now, this one has pork. So this is kind of unusual. You don't usually see pork in it. 
um, but uh, he's got lots of vegetables, the uh, olive oil incorporated. And um, this one looks like was done in a slow cooker. And uh, so, yeah, so, I mean, there's some flexibility, obviously. I mean, you will sometimes see pork and beef showing up, not real common, but it is there. Um, and he did even say in the picture, you could substitute chicken if you wanted to. So um, very pretty presentation, you know, very delicious looking. It makes me hungry actually looking at it. So, so tonight um, I'm going to now transition over to uh, my meal preparation here. I'm going to move my camera over to my tripod so we can start to look at what I'm going to do. Um, and we'll have to adjust this camera, I think, probably a little bit here. But at any rate, um, tonight's recipe is a Greek bean and vegetable soup. This was not something I created myself. Um, this is from the um, Diabetes Association website. You can download this and um, uh, make it yourself. And we'll send you some materials via email with the web link to that. But really, you can just Google this. Greek bean and vegetable soup, you'll find it pretty quickly on that website. Um, so what I'm going to do next, I'm going to actually make this meal here live. And as I'm kind of, you know, stir frying some stuff and making some stuff, um, that's your opportunity. You can ask some questions um, and that will sort of help me moderate that and kind of pass along anything that's in the chat. Um, but uh, basically a uh, very, very simple recipe. Um, this goes with my philosophy that when you're trying to mo you know, mo manage your calories, you, you want to have simple, healthy recipes that are easy to make, not too terribly hard. Um, I would recommend if you're going to make something like this, make sure you have enough servings. Um, you know, this one, I think they said serve, I don't know, four or something like that. Um, or actually only serves two, I think. Yeah, serves two. Um, if I'm going to do this for a weight management situation, I'm going to make a lot of leftovers and I'll be eating on this for several days. So I would probably double or even triple this recipe, especially if you've got, you know, other people in the household that are going to eat it. And uh, that way you have leftovers. You come home from work, you just pull this out, you know exactly how many calories it is, you know, it's healthy and you can easily track it in your tracker if you're monitoring your calories and it works really well. Um, but again, my choice of recipes are generally ones that are simple and easy. Nothing really crazy, you know, usually I don't go for weird ingredients. There's nothing saying that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, if you like cooking, uh, a lot of people do, they're, they're, you know, there's nothing wrong with more exotic recipes or whatever. Um, but uh, I'm somebody who's very practical and I just, I want to have something that's wor that works, that's relatively easy to do. And um, so this is one of those kind of options here. Um, so basically with this, I'm just going to heat some oil. I'm going to saute some vegetables. I got onion, zucchini, celery, and garlic. Those are already pre-chopped. Um, that's just going to go for a few minutes till they get a little softer. And then I'm going to put in the vegetable broth, water and beans and tomatoes. Um, and then that cooks for a few more minutes. And then we just add the spinach and thyme and until it wilts. And uh, that's when the black pepper is in there as well. And then that's pretty much it. Um, you serve it with some bread, some feta cheese, and you sprinkle some pistachios on top. So pretty easy. And uh, so in terms of uh, the stats on this guy, why is it healthy? Well, it's low in calories, 420. The 420 is because we have a slice of bread and some feta cheese and those nuts. That brings it up. Otherwise, it, it'd be pretty, pretty low. But, um, you know, that's still really low. 400 calories, even if you're on a 1,200 calorie diet, which is about the lowest we prescribe for anybody, you could fit this into that, uh, no, no trouble. So... Uh, sodium is modest, 470. Uh, you know, you, you want to stay within about 2,300 milligrams for the day. This will, you know, help you sort of stay within that range. Uh, protein is high, so we got 20 grams. That's a really good protein uh, for a meal. So for your dinner, maybe or your lunch, that's that's a good level of protein. And there's no added sugars. So there are sugars. Those are sugars inherent with the vegetables. Those are not added sugars. So you're not actually pouring sugars. There's no processed stuff in this. So um, without further ado, I'm going to attempt to unshare this, stop presenting, and there we go. Now I'm back to the screen where I can see my little 
pot here and some of my vegetables and stuff. And uh, I will hand it over to Annette. And for you guys, if you want to ask any questions as I start this process, feel free. And uh, without questions, what I'm going to do is just I'm going to start heating up my pan here. And we're going to start sauteing some vegetables for you guys. So let me get this turned on. Our guests yeah. can unmute your own um, computer and ask questions if you would like. Otherwise, I can read it from the chat. So I've got some olive oil here. So this is my Pam olive oil spray. You can also just use, you know, out of a jar. And they say about a tablespoon. I'm not going to even use that much. I mean, it's probably a teaspoon of olive oil in here. Um, but you can use a little bit more if you pour it on. I just find the spray is a lot more convenient. And uh, the first part is you just want to put your vegetables in there to saute. So I've got about half a cup of uh, celery here, I believe it is. So I'm going to go ahead and get this on there. And because I have this crazy induction top, it's actually already hot and it's sizzling. And I'm going to put in my chopped up zucchini. So this is about, again, about a cup of zucchini. It's a little more than a cup, actually, it turned out. But that's one zucchini. Um, just kind of cut into quarters. And then I've got my onions and a little bit of garlic there. I don't know how well you can see that. But uh, anyway, so I got my little wooden spoon here. So it's all added in there. And I'm just going to start stirring this around. I might have to cut the, the power down a little bit so I don't burn anything here. It looks like it's going really good. So let's cut that down a little bit. I'm going to turn the hood on a little bit too. Hopefully it's not going to make too much noise here. Let's put it on low at least. So if you guys have any questions, um, if you're brave enough to unmute, go ahead and do that. Um, uh, you can also, again, just if you can use the chat feature, go ahead and pose your questions on there. and I'm happy to answer them for you. One of the um, guests named Eve has said that she loves the citrus part in the salmon dish. I mm -hmm. learned that there's always used acidity to balance out the fat, vinegar or lemon when using olives and beans, also gelato with lemon and other fruits to balance after the heavy pasta. Yeah, and it does seem there's a lot of citrus incorporated when you look at these recipes that are out there um, with the way that they're eating, you generally will see lemon or sometimes orange incorporated. This one doesn't really, uh, this particular one isn't using that, but uh, I mean, there's nothing to say that you can't put a little lemon juice in it at the end or something. But yeah, as far as the culinary aspects of things, like, you know, sort of what I would call like the chef kind of cooking aspects, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not as, as educated in some of those finer points, to be honest with you. <laughs> You know, as dietitians, we do have to kind of, you know, take a cooking class. We have to learn a little bit about cooking methods. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of us aren't necessarily, you know, chefs. I mean, some people really get into it and they, they do have a lot of skill in that area. I'm more of a uh, kind of a practical cook, I guess. Um, so some of the finer points may escape me on some of the seasoning and things of that nature. Um, what I typically do is I will acquaint myself with a large number of cookbooks um, and then gradually sort of go through different ones. And I've come up over the years with a lot of recipes that I like, um, you know, that, that are good for me personally. And, you know, you get to the point where after a while you can sort of make them from memory and stuff like that. Um, but I do know there's people that are very creative in the kitchen and they kind of just grab some ingredients and come up with something new, which is pretty amazing to me. Um, and that's fine. Um, sometimes you have to be careful if you're trying to track calories that, you know, um, you sort of know how much you're putting into some of these things when you make them. But, um, but yeah, I mean, everyone's a little different in what they like to do, and that's fine. Yeah. 
if you'd like to ask a question, you go ahead and unmute. Also, if you um, press your space bar, you can, as long as you're pressing the space bar down, you can talk. And when you release, you'll be muted again. See, I didn't even know that. <laughs> it's the little thing. It's the finer points of teams. And we also had a comment from John Tarda um, saying, please do a program on dieting with blood thinners. Hmm. Yeah, I've definitely never had that request before. That's an interesting one. Um, you know, with some of the blood thinners, I mean, uh, with Coumadin, there's an issue with vitamin K, and you have to sort of be careful as far as kind of keeping your vitamin K levels constant. And that used to be a big education we give in the hospitals. But there's been some other, there's been changes with some of the medications. And, you know, some of them now, there's really not a restriction on that. So um, it does kind of depend on, on your specific situation, you know, with some of those thinners. But good question, interesting question. I appreciate it. So this, these are getting a little softer. <laughs> I always find, you know, when I see these recipes, they'll say, you know, saute this thing for, they always say like two to three minutes. Well, for some reason when I saute, I guess I don't use as high a temperature as you're supposed to. It usually takes me more like five to 10 minutes. Um, but I think, you know, generally, I guess when people are sauteing, they've got it cranked up pretty high on a gas burner or something. Um, but generally, you know, you just want to get the things that are so they're kind of soft before you go to the next step. And uh, we're getting pretty close. And it's all just a matter of taste. There's, you know, obviously there's not really a right or wrong. If you have crunchy vegetables in your soup, you know, maybe that's your thing. I mean, <laughs> it's not going to be any less healthy. Sometimes I get that question, like, you know, if you cook something, are you losing the nutrients and that kind of thing? Generally, the answer is no. Um, of course, if you burn things, um, that changes it a little bit. But it, and if you retain the, the fluids, if it's like a soup, um, you know, generally you're fine. Uh, uh, it's only if you pour off some of the broth that you kind of lose nutrients. But, you know, if you have like a crispy texture versus a soft texture, I mean, it's not really changing it per se, as far as like the nutrient content. So I think these are pretty soft now. So what I'm gonna do is go to the next step here. So what we're doing next is adding the vegetable broth. Uh, there's some water, beans, and tomatoes. So what I have here is Pacific Foods brand free range chicken broth. So it's you can generally find these in Kroger or whatever food line. It's a one cup little single serving thing. And because I'm not doubling or tripling the recipe, this is gonna work just fine. Now they say vegetable broth, but I sort of go back and forth between chicken and vegetable. A lot of times I'll use vegetable, but this is what I had on hand. And so that's what's getting used. Um, and then you put in the beans. These are uh, great Northern beans. You can see that. Um, this was a can of beans I picked up at Food Lion today. And uh, to get them lower in sodium with beans, you just rinse them off. So just run some water in the can, sort of pour it off. And you can get rid of a lot of the sodium that way. Um, so if you're finding beans that are not reduced sodium and you need that, um, I would just recommend doing that method. There are a lot more uh, <coughs> beans nowadays that are low sodium. Um, but sometimes like in this particular case, I mean, I was trying to get exactly the ones they mentioned. They were saying like Great Northern or I think uh, Navy beans or something. And so to get the Great Northern, I had to actually uh, get the regular. They didn't have a low sodium version for that. So, so I'm going to try to turn this up a little bit. I think it, uh, for some reason it kind of turned itself off there. I don't know what it's doing. Okay, so we got the heat back on. And uh, so they want you to sort of break these tomatoes up. So um, it's about a cup of tomatoes. These are whole tomatoes. And you just sort of, you know, just for taste. I guess, you know, most people don't want to eat an entire tomato in their mouth. So you try to kind of cut these up. 
with the spoon as you're cooking them. So, so that is the recipe as it was written. So if this seems like a dumb method, blame the recipe. <laughs> so I'm following their, their directions. Um, I was sort of wondering when I was doing this, maybe I should just kind of pre-cut the tomatoes, but they said, you know, kind of cut them up when they're in the, on the pot there. So, so, so this just needs to kind of heat up and simmer. See if I can get this thing to, to come to a boil again. And sometimes it'll help if you kind of cover it a little bit there. I think I hear some rumbling. So there we go. So that's just going to kind of cook for a few minutes here. I can definitely field any other questions you guys might have while we're waiting for that. And then the last step would be to add the spinach and thyme. That's a very quick step. I mean, the spinach, if you've ever cooked with it, it, it wilts pretty quick. And then you're pretty much done. Um, I got some feta cheese here. This is, again, just a Food Lion product I picked up. Pistachios. Um, I actually had to get some that were shelled because I couldn't find any unshelled ones. And I shelled a bunch of them and just chopped them up. And spinach, nothing special here. It's just, you know, spinach sleeves. I got some uh, the thyme kind of sprinkled on there and the black pepper. So that's really it. Um, you know, as far as preparation, this whole thing probably is, you know, from start to finish, if I include the chopping and all that, we're probably looking at, you know, 30, 45 minutes, I would say. The chopping always takes me a little bit. If you're a really quick chopper, you can probably cut that down. But, um, and again, for me, generally, I would make more than one serving of this if I'm going to make this. So any, any other questions from anybody? Feel free to just chime in while we're hanging out here. Or any suggestions for future classes? We have the one about the, the blood thinners. Does anyone have any other suggestions, things you'd like to see? That's always helpful for me, too. Um, I might be able to do a bonus class or fit in another topic this year. Um, is there anything in particular you want to see? And, um, or even just, you know, maybe a component to an existing talk that something you'd like to see included. Just a note for the folks that are in on our telephone, if you need to unmute your, com your telephone, you can hit star six. I did not know that either, so that's good. There is one thing that's been troubling me for years and years and years. And who's this? This is Donald. Oh, OK. Hello, Donald. Hi. Something that's always troubled me is cooking healthy for one. Yeah, I hear you. Um, so I am married, however, <laughs> my wife and I have very different ideas about healthy cooking sometimes. And I know this is being recorded, so I can't say too many bad things, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it is it is kind of uh, a challenge at times. I mean, uh, and especially if you want a variety and that kind of thing, a lot of these recipes you end up with, you know, enough to last you, you know, two weeks or something crazy. I've had to freeze some of them because it's just too much. You got to divide things down. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, uh, this recipe, this actual recipe here is actually pretty appropriate for one. It'd probably make you about two servings. So it's definitely not going to be, you know, a giant volume you have to deal with. Um, but yeah, I know some people just don't want to go through the motions. It's sort of not as appealing when you're just doing it for yourself um you know so i understand um you know the if we weren't in COVID, i'd say well you know, invite some friends over and, and share some of these things but you know <laughs> pretty soon hopefully we will no longer be uh thinking about that as much and or you know be outside or whatever when it's warmer at least Right now, it's, I mean, I've got ice all outside here, so not really too inviting to go out there and eat right now. I think it's about 
20 degrees outside or something crazy. All righty, so that, that's uh, kind of boiling there. And uh, so I think it's been, it's probably been pretty close to almost five minutes here. And so we can probably go ahead and add the spinach. So this is spinach with thyme and pepper already put in there. So we'll incorporate that. And I love the colors. That's one thing I like about these types of recipes. And a lot of times, like I say, when you're eating healthier, you notice there's a lot more colors. When you get the produce involved, you get a lot more kind of pretty meals, you know, aesthetically pleasing meals. And, you know, if you're working, I guess, as a chef, um, that's an important consideration. You don't want to have a meal that's the whole plate's gray, you know. That's one thing they taught us in school is that, you know, if your your presentation is all one color, a lot of people don't find that very appealing and they don't really want to eat it if it's all gray. You know, they want to see some different different uh, visual contrasts in there, so. This one definitely has that. I mean, you got some yellows, reds, greens, um, you know. So this is wilting pretty good. It's always amazing with the spinach, you know, you go from this volume of several cups down to just almost nothing you know it wilts away and turns a little tiny thing so <laughs> you kind of think at first oh that's too much spinach and then it's like oh where'd it go so that's pretty much pretty much it i'm just going to let that simmer for a little bit more and um you know, that's pretty much the size of it. Uh, I'm going to, you know, when I actually plate out my bowl, I'm going to have that with some feta cheese and the nuts on top. So we can go ahead and open the feta cheese here. And again, encourage you guys, if you have any questions, feel free to throw those out there as we're about to wrap things up here for tonight, I think. And uh, if there's anything you missed tonight, again, Hopefully this will be presented or uploaded eventually. And also there's going to be materials sent to you on an email um, that kind of goes over the links for this recipe and some other um, really good resources that you can look at for information about the Mediterranean diet and also recipe information. So just kind of look for that. And uh, there's also going to be a feedback form. I encourage you guys to fill that out. That will be emailed to you as well. And that helps me to kind of see areas that you might like to see for the future once again, um, you know, or different things you'd like to see. And that's always kind of useful information. I mean, some of today's class I adjusted based on feedback that I've gotten from previous classes. I know one time um, I, I focused a lot on sort of the weight loss aspect, but not enough on the actual Mediterranean pattern itself. Um, and so I tried to make those changes tonight. Uh, to really give you more of the, the feel for what this is. So I'm going to turn this down to low. I'm going to actually eat this for my dinner tonight. Um, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, is there any other questions? Annette, do you see any anything in the chat? or? I'm just taking a look and no, there are no other questions. Okay. Thanks for giving us all this information today. That's kind of cool. Yeah. I, I like the different colors in there, the greens and the reds and the yellows. I know, and it looks I like a teeny. Look, looks like a flag almost in here. <laughs> yeah, it's really pretty. So, so I'm going to go ahead and put this in my own bowl here. This is my going to be my dinner. And I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of feta in there. And few pistachio nuts on top and voila there we go so there's my dinner and a little piece of bread on the side that'll kind of help uh, round it out 
All righty. Well, thank you guys for joining me tonight. I really appreciate it and look forward to the next class uh, with all you guys in a couple of months here. So uh, stay tuned for the March class. And what is our March class? What uh, Remind us what that title is going to be. So that one's going to be about physical fitness and weight loss. So we're going to talk a little bit about physical fitness as it relates to helping you with weight loss specifically. And there's also, again, going to be a food segment. So we'll have a, a healthy meal presented at the end. Um, so that's going to be March's focus. And it's kind of as we kind of get into the warmer weather months, people are going to be looking to kind of go outside more and do more more walks, jogs, bike rides, things with the family and stuff. So it's kind of a good time to kind of rethink maybe some of that, some of the physical activity aspect. I know right now people are not too excited. It's it's kind of cold and nasty. And, you know, so <laughs> I think Mediterranean, especially a soup, is kind of a good meal to have right now, you know, with the cold weather. So, um, so yeah, hope to see you guys there. Thank you a lot, Bert. We'll see you in March. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>